Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Welcome to or back to Corsair Trainers. Today we are going delve back into a subject most do not want to touch or discuss in the preparedness community. Can you survive natural and man-made emergency situations in the city and suburban areas? In order to have this discussion, we first have to define what exactly we are discussing in order to dispel any of the fantasy or falsehoods one normally hears when this subject is brought up. What is the area we are discussing and what are the risks? Right out of the gate, we have to take a few scenarios off the table. Of course, the first question is, why take any scenarios off the table? This is going to be done due to these scenarios being so far down the list of situations. In all likelihood, no one will face these situations. What are the removed scenarios? Any scenario where the obvious answer is to leave, such as nuclear attack or conventional war with fighting directly in the area, biological or chemical weapons discharged into an area, volcano eruption, alien invasion, and all the other scenarios which common sense tells us it is a good time to leave. In reality, most situations people are going to be faced with, the answer is not just to leave. Defining the area. For our purposes here, we will use the U.S. Census Bureau definition on how areas are designated. The U.S. Census Bureau defines urban areas as regions with a densely settled population and two key types of urban areas. Urbanized areas, UAs, population of 50,000 or more people. These areas typically include large cities and their surrounding densely populated suburbs. Urban clusters, UCs, with a population of at least 2,500 but less than 50,000 people. These areas include smaller towns and communities that are still considered urban based on population density and infrastructure. For needs here, urban areas are characterized by higher population densities, built environments, housing, businesses, infrastructure, and a concentration of economic activities. The Census Bureau typically considers areas outside these thresholds to be rural. For our discussion, we will use the terms urban, city, suburban, and rural, which are the more common ways of expressing these. What percent of the world's population lives in an urban environment? As of 2023, approximately 56% of the world's population lives in urban environments. This reflects a significant trend toward urbanization with more people moving to cities and towns for better job opportunities, services, and amenities. Developed regions like North America and Europe have much higher urbanization rates, often exceeding 75 to 80 percent. Developing regions like Africa and parts of Asia still have large rural populations, but urbanization is accelerating rapidly. As of 2023, approximately 83 percent of the U.S. population lives in urban environments. This figure reflects the continued trend of urbanization in the United States, with most Americans residing in cities, suburbs, or metropolitan areas rather than rural areas. Let that sink in for a moment. 83%. Only about 17% live in rural areas. These figures here give a great example of why we believe more time needs to be spent discussing how to plan for, survive, and recover from situations based on being in one of these areas 83% of the population lives in. What are the common scenarios one could face in these environments? We will divide this listing into two types of scenarios, natural and man-made disasters. First, let's discuss the natural ones. These are the most common types of situations we could find ourselves having to deal with. Flooding is the most common natural disaster. Flooding can be caused by a variety of factors, including storm waves, tidal action, and channel shifts, hurricanes, and tropical storms. These powerful disasters can cause significant destruction and in a lot of cases bring us back to flooding, tornadoes. These violent storms can produce winds of over 200 miles per hour but are relatively short-lived. Wildfires can affect urban and suburban areas and are more likely to occur during droughts, earthquakes, and tsunamis. These disasters can strike suddenly and without warning, adding to the list of natural disasters one could have to deal with. These following situations can also be considered natural disasters, avalanches, blizzards, and hailstorms, along with mudslides, drought, heat waves, ice storms, landslides, lightning, riverine flooding, strong wind, sinkholes, and thunderstorms. 
The number one natural disaster people deal with on a yearly basis in the United States is not what most people think of when they think of emergency preparedness or prepping. What is it? Flooding is the most common natural disaster in the United States, accounting for 90% of all natural disasters. Floods can cause significant economic damage, loss of life, and property damage. Floods can be caused by a number of events, including heavy rains, flash flooding, mud flows, snow, coastal storms, storm surges, overflow of dams, and other water systems. It is easy to see how one or more of the other events we listed can lead to flooding being the biggest problem you're faced with. Have you prepared for a flood? The list of man-made disasters can be just as extensive, yet it can also be location-specific for some of the situations. How many of these fall into your area of concern? If you are unsure, you might want to start by conducting a survey of your local area. Although man-made disasters are always changing or evolving, here is a general list. Chemical spills, hazardous material spills, explosives, rail accidents, airline crashes, groundwater poisoning, crime, arson, civil disorder, terrorism, cyber attacks. Do you have any to add to this list? If you do, add them in the comments. Keep in mind the ones we are excluding from the list right now. This can seem to be a daunting list of scenarios one could face living in an urban or suburban area. What are the advantages of urban environments during emergencies? We can start with access to resources such as hospitals and medical facilities. Urban areas have more hospitals, clinics, and specialized medical services, which can be crucial for serious injuries or illnesses. Next would be government support. Cities are often prioritized for government aid and disaster relief efforts due to the population density. You might see faster responses from agencies like FEMA or the Red Cross. Commercial supplies can also be considered an advantage. There are more stores, grocery, hardware, pharmacies in urban areas. Even during disruptions, it's likely there are multiple nearby options to gather supplies. Some businesses may have emergency generators, allowing them to stay open longer. Next large advantage could be infrastructure, such as public transportation. Many cities have buses, subways, or trains that may still operate during certain emergencies. This can be useful if fuel becomes scarce or roads are blocked. Communication is another. Urban areas have denser cellular networks, radio stations, and internet services, making it easier to stay informed and communicate. Utilities, even though utilities may be disrupted in severe cases, urban centers often restore power, water, and gas services more quickly due to their critical role in the economy. In large cities, the advantage of shelter options cannot be overlooked. Cities typically have more shelters such as community centers, schools, or stadiums, which can provide temporary refuge in the event of displacement. Multifamily buildings may have backup generators, water storage systems, and security. Staying in a high-rise during some emergencies, like floods, can also offer safety at higher floors. Community networks also have to be considered. Urban areas often have strong community organizations or neighborhood groups that can mobilize quickly during a crisis. These mutual aid groups can provide food, medical supplies, or assistance to those in need. The diverse population in urban settings means you're more likely to find someone with critical skills like medical training, engineering, or mechanics, which can be vital during prolonged emergencies. Let's move on to the advantages of suburban environments during emergencies. Suburban areas often have many of the same resources as urban areas like grocery stores and hardware stores, though they may be less dense and not depleted as quickly during the first wave of panic. Suburbs are less crowded than cities, making it easier to navigate roads, access stores, and obtain fuel. It's easier to avoid large crowds, reducing the risk of panic or violence. There is the potential to be self-sufficient for a period of time in suburban areas. Suburban homes often have yards or gardens, allowing for small-scale food production. This can be a critical source of food if supply chains are disrupted for an extended period. Rainwater harvesting or using wells can be easier in a suburban setting, as homes typically have more space for water storage systems. Suburban homes often have garages or basements offering more space for stockpiling food, water, tools, and medical supplies compared to small apartments in cities. Suburban areas have less traffic than urban centers, making evacuation smoother in case of a large-scale emergency. The ability to use personal vehicles also makes it easier to transport supplies. Being in a suburban area gives you flexibility. 
you can access the city for certain resources or head into rural areas for food or water, depending on the situation. Suburban neighborhoods tend to be more tightly knit compared to urban areas. Neighbors are more likely to know each other and cooperate, which is critical for resource sharing and mutual security. We would be remiss if we did not also include the benefits of rural or small town environments during emergencies. Many rural residents grow their own food or raise livestock, giving them a much higher degree of self-sufficiency. Access to hunting, fishing, and foraging also offers more food sources than urban or suburban environments. Rural areas often have access to wells, natural springs, rivers, and ponds. This makes it easier to find water, provided you have the means to purify it. Many rural homes use off-grid energy sources like solar panels, wind turbines, or wood-burning stoves. In case of long-term power outages, they are better equipped to generate their own energy. Fewer people means less competition for resources and a reduced likelihood of civil unrest or violence. Small towns and rural areas are less likely to be targets for terrorist attacks or widespread destruction during national emergencies. They are also further from industrial accidents or hazards typical of cities. Small towns and rural areas often have tight-knit communities where people know and help each other. The culture of mutual aid is strong and people often pool resources or skills to survive emergencies. Small towns may have local food sources like farms, mills, or fisheries. Local government and churches can also play a significant role in organizing relief efforts quickly. Rural homes tend to sit on larger parcels of land, giving residents space for gardening, livestock, and storage. This space can be useful for long-term survival planning and maintaining privacy during a crisis. By first defining the terms to be used, we can have a more productive conversation concerning the subject. Most people do not realize they live in what would be considered an urban environment to start with. Breaking this down to urban, suburban, or rural definitely makes it easier to discuss. As we can see, each area has to contend with all or some of the natural disasters. Here in Southern California, we do not have to deal with snow, ice, or any natural disasters concerning real cold situations. We do, as everyone else has to, have to deal with floods. Did you know the number one natural disaster is flooding? Can you see how one natural disaster occurring can have the additional effect of flooding? How does flooding being the number one natural disaster change your thoughts on the subject? Each of these environments has its benefits and disadvantages. No one area is impervious to issues. When looked at through the lenses of what is more likely to occur, taking out the far extremes of what could happen, we get the idea that survival is something everyone can do, no matter their location. People have survived all of the events we have listed in the past and people will survive future incidents, either man-made or natural. To think otherwise simply degrades one's primary tool of survival, the mindset of survival, the will to survive, knowing there is always something else you can do to survive no matter where you are located. I would like to thank everyone who has made it this far. We're going to explore the subject of urban survival in greater detail in future videos. Special thank you to the crew members and Patreon supporters. Your continued support keeps us pushing to put out useful and reality-based content. Thank you again, and as always, stay safe.